Will the US banks are solved? Get involved. Well, that's obviously tongue in cheek, but we are seeing a more positive vibe coming across markets as we see implied volatility suppressed. We see the Japanese yen getting chopped up and we see the Nasdaq on a bit of a flyer. But could this be month and quarter end flows playing through? But Blake can ask whether this feel good factor has more legs and whether there's more juice in that trade. This is the trade off. Well, hi there. I'm Chris Weston, Head of Research here at Pepperstone. I'm going to be joined in two seconds by Blake Morrow from Forex Analytics. We're going to be discussing the big factors playing through, and that script is changing right before our eyes as these markets are dynamic and they evolve, and we do see different flows taking place. But of course, as we go into month and quarter end, things can be markedly different as we go into the Q2. And what a Q2 it's shaping up to be. It's going to be a very lively one indeed. And there's a lot of dynamics to discuss. Mr. Blake Morrow, come into the program, if you will. Well, how are you, You're mate? Right, <laughs> I'm back from Hong Kong. I think everyone's quite relieved not to see the inner sanctums of my bedroom anymore or my hotel room anymore. Um, but yeah, we're back. Good to be back in Melbourne with the family. It's my 11th wedding anniversary today, so yeah, good, a happy anniversary to my lovely wife. I'm sure a lot of the uh, the females watching will be devastated by that one. Uh, but there we go. Uh, anyway, how are you, mate? You well? I'm doing well. Happy anniversary to you and your wife. 11 years. That's a that's quite an accomplish accomplishment of your wife. So, <laughs> very much so. Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. <laughs> but look, Blake, it's, uh, we come up to month and quarter end. We're going to discuss a lot of these factors in Topical Thunder. I'm seeing Q2 in the mix, and it's shaping up to be a blockbuster. This, this, We talk about you know, trading like a ninja, keeping an open mind, reacting to the flows and uh, those bits and pieces. But for me, Q2 is going to be one of those ones where we continue to just be humbled by by the price action and, and, and you know, the narrative that changes, right? We are. And, you know, I, I think one of the biggest, you know, uh, well, we'll talk a lot about this moving forward. But man, this week's price action is much different than the last the previous three or four weeks. I, I have to admit, I mean, it, and it's changing. And that's you say trade like a ninja. And I think that that saying will go a long <laughs> way throughout all of 2023. Chris. 23 and 24. Anyway, let's go to topical funder. Let's look at the big themes that are going through the market today. All right, well, let's start with the banks. Um, look, I mean, we're going across, across asset class at the moment, we are seeing a, a slightly more positive factor. Um, the banks have, have caused a big repricing in terms of rates. And we go back to the 9th of March, we're pricing in 27 basis points of hikes between the May and, and December FOMC meeting. There was a, the banks, obviously, we, we saw the, the failing of Silicon Valley and, and Signature Bank. And then we saw yeah, one of the biggest moves we've ever seen in, in the rate markets. We saw yeah, that flip into 120 odd basis points of cuts playing through. Those rate cuts have been coming out of the market to an extent, and we will talk about them in the moment. But the banks, for me, seem to be a little bit more ring fence. We know there's big issues with commercial real estate, and we've seen that in in the commercial um, mortgage-backed security market. The office uh, you know, credit markets are getting absolutely destroyed at the moment. Um, but if you look at high-yield credit spreads, yeah, they are fairly well contained. We are seeing a situation where the, the broader credit industry, industry uh, indices, um, uh, yeah, they have deteriorated a little bit, but they're not at levels where I'm generally concerned. So it does seem that this is ring fenced. Yeah, there's too many banks in the US, in my opinion, well over 4,000 banks. It's going to be consolidation. We know other banks are probably going to be at the issue. But, you know, are we out of the woods, Blake, in terms of the banks? Because yeah, it's still a moving part. And, and the headlines, I mean, over the next 24 hours, we're going to be getting the take up from the Fed's liquidity facilities, you know, the H41 um, facility program, where we're going to be looking at what happens with the uh, the bank term funding procedures there, and obviously the discount window, and we'll look at the, the take up of liquidity and credit from that, but that's one factor. Um, we're going to be looking at it flows to money market funds. On Friday, we, we get the... Um, the, the Fed's uh, liabilities and, and commercial uh, bank liabilities and assets, and that could give us a bit more understanding about big banks' asset flows. So there's a lot to play for. This, the banks are not out of the woods, in my opinion, but the market's trading like it's it's kind of ring fenced here. Yeah, well, we're gonna we're gonna talk about actually just in the next topic, which we're not gonna go to just yet. We're gonna talk about the stock market price action, but I, I'm gonna I'm gonna. I want to make sure I know a lot of your viewers are in Australia and I know you're Australian Asia heavy. Uh, so being in the United States, uh, one of the ETFs that I follow very closely, especially right at this moment in time is the KRE. 
Mm. And that's the S&P Regional Banking Index. Mm. And if yeah, it was up a percent today. But if you look at the price action and you look at the sell off over the course of the last couple of weeks, all we're doing is just a bearish consolidation, basically at the same levels we've been at for the last week and a half, which is a lot lower, significantly lower. And there's been no bounce. So I'm going to agree with you because price in this case doesn't lie. If 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 if, if the market was really confident that we were past this, the the first ETF you would see is a recovery in the KRE. Yeah, and I did for that. So the KRE, I'm, to, I'm I'm with you on the KRE. I think that that to me is the first derivative. Now, bank equity is not a deposit. Yeah, deposits are insured on an implicit basis, on case by case basis. Depositors are not going to be given a haircut anytime soon. The market would see that as a systematic, a systemic issue. But the KRE is just trading between forty six and forty two dollars at the moment. And you're right, it's consolidating. When that breaks out to the upside, yeah, I feel a bit more positive about the world. But if it breaks down through forty two dollars, you know, I think these interest rate cuts will, will will increase. Gold will rally again. So that's that's that to me is is, is re- one of the most important markets out there right now is the KRE forty six to forty two dollars. If it breaks Breaks either two side of that, and that dictates my my trading bias. I think you bring up a really good point there. So, put the car on your radar. I think that's that. That's you know, one of the most important markets there. There we go. Well, let's talk about the market as a whole. Let's talk about the equity markets, Chris. You know, one like I like I was mentioning to you a bit ago, the the stock market um, is acting so much different this week than it has. I wouldn't say for the last couple of weeks, but it's very low volatility. You've seen the VIX drop to some pretty important support. You've got stocks grinding higher, dips have been bought, and and it's you have end of month, end of quarter, all of these flows are coming through the market, and, and it's insatiable flows. And 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 I have to imagine there's a lot of hedge funds institutions that are caught offside right now. I've I've read a lot of uh, uh, statistics about the market being hedged for you know downside. A lot of a lot of a lot of institutions are covering, and then mm. you got the the the, the uh, what's the acronym you use? FOMI, fo, 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 FOMO, uh, fear of, fo, no, not FOMO, FOMO, uh, FOMO, fear of yeah, meaningfully so, underperforming. Correct, and you know you're going into the end of quarter at, as you're an, you're an institution. If you're underperforming and you're misallocated and you and and you just are not fully levered up and and showing your investors that you're in the market, you're in it to win it, you're going to have redemption. So. You know, I think you're getting a lot of end of month and a quarter flows that are coming through the market. And like I said, it's insatiable right now. And I know people are, oh, shorts and bears are just banging their head up against the wall. But price action right now is dictating that we're going higher, at least in the, you know, maybe over the next couple of days. What are your thoughts on the price action of stocks this week? Because like I said, much different this week than it's been in the last few weeks. Screams of flow, doesn't it? I mean, it's, everyone's trying to put a, a a reason on the price action, but you know, the the what we're seeing is that that options dealers, market makers, are a short gamma, and as the market's been pushing higher, I think we are seeing some 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 hedging flows breaking through. They're buying the underlying futures as it goes up. I think that's that's exasperated the move up a little bit. Um, CTAs, we're hearing that CTAs are getting longer um, in in terms of. S and P futures, Nasdaq futures, and again, so a lot of that's very opaque. You've got to be a flow desk at an investment bank to see that that sort of flow, and they report it to their to their clients. Um, and so you've got to be privileged to see that information coming through. It sort of drips through to most of retail traders through the through the through the through the news publications, you know, T plus one, and all those kind of factors. So for the banks, one of the, one of the buy side, one of the Obviously, the, the the positive things with with dealing with investment investment banks is you get to hear about these kind of flows real time. But I think that's what you're seeing. I think a lot of it is flow based um, in terms of what we've been seeing there, and obviously the quarter end and, and month end is a big issue as well. So once we get past um, into the first of April, things may be different. You know, people may look to, to to remove some of those positions coming through. I think also though, Blake, the banks are trading a bit better, but you've still got this element of rate cuts, volatility in the rates markets and bond market. It has subsided. And I think people have put money to work on the back of that as well. So there's a lot of factors playing for it. It's certainly not driven by uh, earnings at this point. Yeah, very good. There you go. No, I, I think the, the the rates market is interesting there because you know we, we talk about what's happened um, with the banks, and and you are seeing a very strong correlation between bank equity prices uh, and gold. I've got a chart to show you on that. Um, bank equity. And the level of rate cuts and rate, um, you know, the, the extent by which markets are pricing in rate cuts, the, what we then see, the, the extent by which we're pricing in rate cuts um, has a big implication on gold as well. So there is, 
I, I dare say it's all kind of one trade, um, and and really that's defined by by what's happening in banks at the moment, and then that's sort of flowing through into growth. So the Nasdaq's been working quite well as well. But are we in a situation, Blake, where you know? People are going to start moving away from this kind of financial instability that's driven by banks and then refocus back onto the inflation narrative as we get closer towards the 12th of April and the or 11th of April for you uh, and that next CPI print. We've got the payrolls number just before that and the NFIB small business survey the day before CPI. But are we going to start focusing less on that? And, and what are we pricing in? We're pricing about 12 basis points or so for the next Fed meeting. Um, will we start focusing more on inflation and less on the, the financial instability risk there? Well, I, I, that's a good question. And, um, you know, we are obviously globally seeing some disinflationary pressures, but let's not lose sight of what not only the Fed, but other central banks are looking at is their, what, where, they're, where they want inflation at. And we're nowhere near that, Chris. So if the narrative does turn back to inflation, then the market's going to have to come to grips that, 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 that not only the Fed, but other central banks aren't done. Uh, you know, that means that they're probably going to be very, very hesitant or reluctant. And maybe some central banks out there might, but most of them are going to keep rates at these high levels, I think, for an extended period of time. So do I think cuts are realistic at this point and for the market to be talking about them? I think it's unrealistic at this point for the markets to be thinking that at this stage in the game. But people have been talking about it. It's, 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 it's the thing about the financial media is everybody's like, tries to cling on to some sort of narrative that they think that's going to play out in the market. And, and I just, I really don't believe that that this Fed is going to be your oh mom's Fed, your dad's Fed, your grandpa's <laughs> Fed. I mean, you're yeah. trying to think whose Fed it is, but it's not. <laughs> It's, not, it's it's a different Fed today than it was 10 years ago. I'll tell you what, though. Um, if the KRE breaks above $46, um, then we go into the next CPI print. And well, we get, we'll get we get a strong payrolls number. It'll be above 250000 um, But I think there's a very good chance that core CPI will probably be 0.4, 0.5% uh, month for month. And that would really push that pricing up from 11 basis points being priced for the next Fed meeting. In, with the KRE above forty six dollars, hypothetically, um, and we get a, a what I expect to see is probably 0.4.5 percent. That pricing of eleven basis points would probably be closer towards twenty basis points in that situation, and the market's default position will be that we get one more rate hike from the Fed. But do I see? Yeah, they're currently pricing fifty basis points of cuts between now and the end of the year. I, I don't think that's realistic, in my in my opinion. What they're saying there is going to be there's going to be a massive slowdown in bank credit, the supply and and the cost of credit going into the real economy, and we're probably going to see a recession into the second half of the year. I don't think we're going to see those rate cuts, but you know what happens at the end of the year is not something we do as traders. It doesn't really pay to prophesize that far out. We don't make money from doing that, um, but I do think that fifty basis points at the moment, knowing what I, well, certainly taking a, a set of assumptions, I think is a little bit of a bridge too far. Well, you know, the great thing is, and I know we need to move along, um, I, the great thing is, is when expectations are at certain levels and the market has to reprice it, that just creates more volatility for us as traders. So that's a that's a good thing. Um, so I don't want anybody to lose sight of that. Let's move on to the last topic. And this one's uh, near and dear to your heart more than mine, although I do have some money on the line. I am trading long the Aussie Kiwi, just so you all know. Um, I'm really looking into next week because next week we have the RBA and we have the RBNZ. Now, uh, I, I'm looking to get your opinion here, Chris, specifically because obviously you're the you're the RBA whisperer, -er -er, according to me anyway. Uh, but but the RBA is expected to keep rates unchanged. Uh, that's what market expects. Um, and I'm again, I want to hear your opinion here. But the RBNZ is supposed to raise rates by a quarter quarter. Uh, uh, percent. So, what do you think the RBA is going to do here? I mean, they they've talked a lot, like they're gonna they're gonna hold steady. But do you think that that's really going to be the case, Chris? Yeah, well, I think the minutes were the the insightful factor that, that they were considering um, a, a pause. Now, you know that the debate in Australia is 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 quite emotive um, <clears throat> around what's happening in in, in Aussie rates. Um, 
I personally think that they will pause, but what I think the trade is at the moment is is there is probably some upside in Aussie Kiwi, and the reason being is that we only we've got five basis points being priced of, of tightening for this this current RBA meeting, and I think it should be far higher than that 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 situation. I mean, given where the NAB business survey is, given where yeah you know, the employment situation is, we're full full employment at the moment. The last employment number was very very strong indeed, and given if you actually look at within the components of the CPI print, um, you know. Most of the the disinflation we saw was from tourism, uh, from non-alcoholic beverages, um, and it, and from hotels and various factors. But it's clear that you know that that's a trade that doesn't affect too many people in that situation. The broad basket is actually still in, in is still moving higher. Um, and yeah, whilst we look for the April quarterly CPI numbers coming through, um, it's pretty clear you can make a case, a very compelling case for a rate hike. Um, but you can also suggest you can understand why they would leave rates on hold as well. So what that suggests to me is that that pricing of five basis points is probably too low. It should be somewhere around, you know, that was a 20 percent chance. It should be somewhere to be you know, 40, maybe 50 percent chance coming through. So there's a little bit of juice in that in that trade. Yeah, the market is I mean, clearly, in my opinion, they're either going to raise rates um, or leave them on hold. And if they raise rates, that's them done. So, yeah, the market terminal price would effectively be 385. Um, and that would give me a chance to sell into any kind of Aussie strength in that situation if they were to raise, because I think they would then give us a pretty clear indication that they're done. But, yeah, I think break, to be honest, uh, yeah, I think just looking at that market pricing at the moment, five basis points, I think that's too low. And so, you know, I think the market's underpricing now. If we were to see rates being kept on hold um, and they would give themselves optionality in that statement, then I, I think... Yeah, a large amount of that's priced in. I think the downside is fairly mitigated in that situation. What do you think about that? Well, do, let, let me ask, would the RBA potentially break mold away from a quarter percent like they've done in the past? I mean, is that entirely possible? But it's possible, yeah, absolutely. They yeah. could do that. But uh, I think that they're in a world now where they're, they're probably doing in, moving in, 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 in increments of 25 basis points again. Um, the question, another question is, is if, if, if they were to keep rates on hold, would that be a negative for the for the local equity market and, and send some shocks through? Because they're now, given that, that the inflation is still far too high and the broad part of the basket is still is still concerning. Um, I know the headline inflation is coming back to where they, they suggest that the, the, the June forecast of 6.7% is. Um, will, will that send shockwaves through the market that, that they're, they're really genuine concerned about what's happening in economics? That, that's a factor as well. So, you know, the statement, well, the devil will be in the detail there as well. So one to watch. But yeah, I do think the market is, is mispricing um, the risks for a hike at the moment. Thank you for the, your uh, input there. We <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> anyway, let's go to that. Let, let's go to that's a setup. Let's see some of the technical situations we're seeing. All right, let's go into euro dollar. One of the the, the crowd pleasers, one of the favourites there. Uh, if we could bring up the uh, the chart there. Now, what we've seen uh, is you know some pl- supply coming into one hundred and nine. Um, look, a couple of factors I look at, Blake, is is um, the relative performance of European banks relative to the relative performance of US banks. I think that's a big driver at the moment. When we see US uh, European banks hedged, currency hedged, unhedged, whatever you want to look at it, um, outperform U- uh, US banks, and you can do that through the ETF side of things. Go and have a look at the EUFN, which is the European bank space relative to the XLF or the KRE. Um, you know, if you just put them as a ratio, you can see there's a correlation with euro dollar. And also we can look at, you know, front end spreads. Have a look at the difference between German um, two year yields and, and, and US two year yields, where obviously monetary policy is set. And we've seen a, a pretty strong correlation when, you know, the German yield outperforms or the, the yield moves up more relative to, to US. We do see euro flows as well. So that's something that I'm watching very, very closely here. But we are seeing supply into 109. Um, yeah, but the downside seems fairly limited into 107.50 at the moment. There's a bit of indecision to really move this one higher. I favor the upside, Blake. How are you seeing this? Well, you know, last week, my play of the day, I was some of that supply at 109 and uh, <laughs> I sold into the I sold into the beast, if you recall. Um, I and, 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 and I'm not and I, it was it worked out great, but I'm going to tell you right now, I don't have much of an opinion about the euro. It's kind of like the dollar index. I have a, it's kind of boxed in between you know, a key level of support, key level resistance. And I think the euro is doing the same thing for me, you know, because it's a pretty much inverse of the dollar index. So uh, I'm just looking for, you know, a top side move to, 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 to possibly fade, see if we fail up there. But on dips, I'm looking to buy. So I really mm-hmm. don't have much of a much of an opinion here. Uh, but I will tell you that the euro does look better against against other currencies 
And so, therefore, it would favor upside in the euro dollar for now. Yeah, I like buying strength. Um, I think, yeah, through 109, we're going to test those 110s. I think that seems to favor. Well, last week, we were, you know, obviously very bullish on the euro because you, know, you had that central bank divergence trade where you know, Lagarde and the rest of the bank were, were, were relatively hawkish compared to everyone else, and market pricing was there. Um, it's actually the, the, you know, the UK at the moment, the Bank of England, that's got the highest, you know, the, the most amounts of hikes that are priced in the curve this year. But, you know, I think some of that's come out. Euro Kiwi still, I think, still has got some upside, um, but I think this needs a bit of work. The market's indecision. I think, yeah, break of one hundred and nine, and you know, I'll be a, a momentum buyer on that. All right. Well, the the chart I want to bring up, which is going to be complementary to your your Euro bullishness, is the the chart in gold, and uh, this is all bowled up and nowhere to go. It's like uh, well it's done. how I feel about gold at the moment. We've yeah. got this bullish pennant that's developed and. I want your focus to look at that descending trend line from the all-time highs there all the way to the, the spike high that we had a couple months back. And then we came down on the 22nd, which was last week. We came down and retested that trend line and we held it. And then we started creating the flag or the pennant. Um, so that's basically at 1930. And my my two cents is the 1930 levels got a hold. If it breaks, then the dynamics dynamics in gold really shift. But I got to ask you this, Chris, give me a bearish thesis on gold. I really don't have any. I mean, it's an inflation hedge. It's a it's a it's a it's a it's a hedge for rates. You've got uh, you've got you know uh, it's a hedge for geopolitical risks uh, for banking risks. I mean, paint me a picture that it's bearish. I don't really see one, but it scares me when I don't see one. That means there's probably one lurking out there somewhere that I'm not seeing. But what are your thoughts here on gold? Well, I think I, I think that it's not an inflation hedge. I'd say it's the absolute opposite of an inflation hedge and, and respectfully so. Why, why do I say that? Because um, if we get a, a weak number relative to expectations in uh, in the next CPI number, well, that just opens the door up for uh, further rate cuts, and that gives the Fed some, some some. And what we've been seeing is gold very strongly correlated to, yeah, you know, the level of rate cuts that are being priced into the market. So, you know, the ba- the bearish picture uh, for gold comes in a scenario where that level of rate cuts come out the market, and we get closer to back towards the zero um, spectrum. Um, I think in that situation, you would see gold actually falling because, as I say, there's been a strong correlation between the level of rate cuts that are coming in the market and the gold price. And so if that level of rate cuts coming out the market, well, I think is where you probably see some dollar strength playing through. And I think gold um, you know, works well. Well, you know, do you know what you can do? Go and buy gold in Japanese yen terms. It's breaking out to the all-time highs. That's that's been the play. That's been the play of the day. XAU, hey, you sound like JPY. Garman. Holy cow! <laughs> Sorry, mate. Uh, but yeah, look, I, I I think that yeah, put a gun to my head. I think this this breaks that this triangle pattern to the upside. They yeah, 70, 80 percent of the time that tends to tends to be the case. Yeah, strength begets strength, and it consolidates within within you know this kind of linear move. But yeah, I think yeah, as I say, I, I think. If you take the view that the KRE breaks above forty six dollars, if we see, you know, the market going refocusing on inflation, and we think there's going to be a strong inflation number, I, I think the level of rate cuts come out of the market. That that to me would be where you know these people who have been selling into two thousand dollars, they're probably validated in that stance and they're probably sitting pretty. But uh, yeah, I wouldn't be fighting that one now. Anyway, let's go into the banks. I want to have a look at the banks. Um, and yeah, I mean we've been talking about the banks at uh, fairly fairly liberally. And what I've done here. That's another school day, isn't it? Is uh, we've got the KRE, which is the candlestick chart, um, and what I've done is I've overlapped the gold price. And what I've done in there is I've just inverted that, so you can see the gold, uh, yeah, the line relative to the candles, and and I've actually I flipped that upside down. So the KRE is, tra- yeah, you, know, you can see a classic that the KRE on the on the hourly chart as it's supposed to be. But what I've done is I've, I've flipped the gold price. Uh, inverted, um, just so you can see the relationship between the two. And I've talked about this idea that um, as banks, uh, bank equity is falling, we see the level of rate cuts increase, and we then see the gold price. I could have put the, the level of rate cuts on there, but I didn't want to make this chart look too confusing with too many lines. But you can see there, Blake, um, that as equities come down, uh, the gold price has come down, and you know if bank equity goes up, we then to see the the gold price coming down. So it goes back to your chart, last chart. What makes gold go down? Well, I think back bank equity goes. Uh, if bank equity goes up, then then gold prices fall. So that yeah, you can see that relationship there. Nothing ever lasts forever, um, like you say. Um, but that that that's what's driving for me the gold price. It's related to rate cuts, and that's what drives the gold price. Have you got any views on that one? No, I don't. But I love the fact that you brought up the KRE. And I didn't know you were going to bring this chart today. So I think it's so great because I think that's a chart that everybody should be focused on. 
Um, but look at that price action, Chris. I mean, well, it's an it's, hourly chart as well. Let's forget. Let's not forget it, that. It, yeah, it's an hourly chart, and it's still not pretty, right? So <laughs> if you if you think that you're if we're past all the banking crisis that we were talking about a little bit earlier, this chart is really a prime example to show you that we're really not. But uh, how? L- let me ask you this: um, I, I you you told us what your bank breakout points were. Would you trade gold in a similar pattern? Uh, I haven't got any levels there. I mean, I think the, the, the key level everyone's focused on is 2000. We, we got up there so many times mm-hmm. and every single time it's just faded, bang, every time. So sellers are in there. So yeah, gold, like, there's, there's no conviction to buy the curry. Every time you see a rally, you know, people are just, just, just you know, massaging, getting out of some of those exposures. There's really no, there's no conviction behind that. Obviously, bank loan lending is going to be falling away. Commercial real estate in the smaller space is is, is in quite a troublesome spot. But look, the big catalyst, and I know if people will be watching this on the weekend, you know, it would have passed. But the big catalyst comes on the market close to for, for you in the session tomorrow, us in the session ahead, Blake. And that is at half past four your time. Uh, the Fed released their um, the, the 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 level of credit that's been taken up through the banks through the BTFP through the discount window, and that could be a big driver of the KRE. It could be a big driver of the XLF, the big the KBW index. So that could be yeah. We're looking, and I think simplistically, um, if we do see a big take up in the BTFP, the the bank term funding program, I think simplistically the market will say the banks have still got this need for capital so that they don't have to sell their assets, and they'll probably take that as a negative. That said. Conversely, if we do see a really small take up and it pulls back you know, significantly from what we saw last week, the market may say that they've got their funding needs out of the way. We're in a much better position and they may take that very positively. So we've got a big catalyst for the banks in the session ahead. Great, 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 uh, great heads up for everybody listening in. So thanks, indeed, Chris. Indeed, indeed. Uh- Oh, go ahead. Do no, you say something else? Oh, that was it. Lead okay. it in. Lead it in. Uh, let's let, let's talk about the U.S. dollar, Japanese yen. Um, this is a, a setup, and this is what I'm looking looking for. So I want to thank you, uh, thank you, Flows. Um, not Mr. Flows, not Mrs. Flows. Uh, it's thank you for the end of fiscal year flows. And and uh, I want to I want to uh, tip my hat to my colleague who traded on a Japanese bank desk for you know multiple years. He, he mentioned this week that, hey, we're, we're dealing in the end of fiscal year flows in Japan. So that yen, if you're wondering why the dollar yen has been so strong or bid or all the other yen pairs, euro yen, pound yen, you know, Aussie yen, whatever you're trading, it's these 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 uh, end of fiscal year flows. And I'm going to use that as an opportunity to sell into. So I'm actually looking for a rally up towards the 13450 to 135 level which comes right around it's like a big zone right there it's around a 618 golden fib you've heard me mention that many times and i'm going to use that level if we get up there to be a seller of dollar yen or a buyer of yen because my outlook on the yen with the change over the boj next month has not changed i still think that the incoming uh, governor ueda is going to be one who's going to be a, a more of a fiscal and monetary hawk. Sorry, Chris, didn't mean to take up all your time. What are your thoughts here? No, mate, you speak. You speak. I was loving it. It's, um, <laughs> you, you, you speak so eloquently. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to be a seller of dollar yen right now. I mean, the yen um, has been carted out, and I think. A large amount of that is down to positioning. The market was running one of the biggest long positions of any of the G10 crosses, uh, G10 currencies. And, and certainly we saw that in the CAD because the CAD, yeah, there, there isn't a currency if you look at bank flows at the moment where uh, the CAD is is, is arguably the, the most shorted currency. So, you know, CAD yens move to the upside, but I wouldn't want to sell it right now. Let's wait until quarter ends out of the way. Let's wait till month ends out of the way. Um, let's see what happens with the banks um, because if, you know, if the KRE breaks down, banks break down again, you know, you are going to see increased volatility once again playing through in the bond market. There's so much, you know, bank bonds are so illiquid at the moment. Certainly rates are very illiquid at the moment. Um, and so, yeah, it could be a situation where the yen strengthens. The yen is your ultimate hedge against the banking instability, as is we're seeing with gold at the moment, certainly more than the US dollar. The yen is the place to go. Um, and so, yeah, well, once we get the quarter out of the way, we may get a bit of a push higher into that situation. I don't want to fade it now. Um, and we may get your fill there, Blake, and that, that'll be one there that we, we keep on our eye. To get your levels in, take your time frames in and see how price reacts into those levels is the key. Anyway, let's go to the play of the day. All right, uh, I want to go bring up the the Nasdaq 100. 
if we can. Okay, Ooh. what we've got here, Blake, is uh, a really nice little uh, situation. We've got this this uh, the, the, the channel there. We've broken out to the upside. We've got the flag pattern. Um, and now what we need is a little bit of work. It's just stuck its beady little head above the precipice um, and people are shooting arrows at it, but it's still surviving quite nicely. Um, but now it needs a bit of work. And, and, and if it continues to break out, um, you know, we've got our eyes on that, those upside targets of 13,800. So I like this setup. It's completed the, uh, yeah, the, the flag pattern. Um, yeah, it's upside targets of 13,800. Just needs a bit of work. I, you know, I think we've got, we've got our eyes on this one very, very closely as we go into quarter and month end. Yeah, I think this is this is one red alert. If this if, if if this moves up a little bit stronger, I'm a buyer into strength. You know, I don't I don't want to be buying buying weakness in this one. I want to wait for that momentum breakout, and I want to trail my stop loss uh, higher there. So yeah, I'll be using something like a three eight day moving average crossover, or just if price was to close below the five day exponential moving average, just as a trailing stop to keep me in the trade. If this breaks higher. I'm a buyer into strength for a potential move as high as thirteen thousand eight hundred. This looks pretty good to me here. Woo, that is that is a nice bull flag, and that is uh, a good definition of the market doing exactly what no one expects it to exactly do. Exactly right. Yeah. Which yeah. which that's what. But have a look, no, but like Apple. Apple looks really good at the moment meta yeah, you know yeah. microsoft ibm they're all in beast mode at the moment so you know this is this is why the nasdaq's your your, your play of the day or well, my plan yeah day. i like it all right well let's uh let's go to the uh the, the sterling and i want to thank mr michael brown over at trader x I, I i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna hat tip him i'm not stealing his idea because I'm looking at it a little bit different than him he's a good lad However, he's a good lad i know i know, he, I, know he's he got, I know he's got his critics but he's a good bloke no, he hates charts, so I'm going to give him some of my charts. Here, didn't that take these charts, Mike? Uh, so, no, uh, really, we're right up against resistance. You know, it's interesting. We had a false breakdown, um, you know, below, like, the 118 level, new trend lows. You see it circled. We reversed, and it gave us that big reversal. False breakdown leads to a breakout going the other direction. We got it. But if you tilt the channel, it's slightly descending. That means the top of that channel comes in closer to 124, really close to where we got today at 123.60, I think was the high somewhere around there. So I'll be looking for moves towards 124 to fade into because you know your risk. And that's the thing about trading is you can take a trade, you can take one side of a range or the other side, you know where your risk is. I know if we break above 124.40, I'm wrong. I've been wrong before, I'll be wrong again, and I know where I'm wrong in this trade, but the risk reward is tilted for shorts. That means for dollar long, so there you go, Chris. That's my play of the day. Well, you know we're going to get abused for copying his trades, but it's like getting a cake. You've just put a bit of icing on the top of it. You've made it a little bit better than what it was before, so uh, thank you, Mr. Brown. <laughs> anyway, I'm sure we get some rebuttals about that one and bring it on. Uh, anyway, thank you to everyone who's been watching. Thank you, Blake, for some of your great suggestions today and great trade ideas. And for everyone who's been watching, give us a like, leave a comment on how you're trading these markets, and we'll see you back next week for more of The Trade-Off. 